Peace and safety news check. My name is Daniel Vallis and welcome to our channel. Definitely review our playlist High Watch Review which covers our recent videos. There is a lot coming together here. I don't have time to rehearse and read the whole dictionary every single video. We're continuing with our study so it is imperative that you be familiar with what we have been studying. So definitely review the videos. Some are pretty short, some are a little bit longer. But that's the main purpose why we're making this video. We're just going to cover some of the news that's been going on. So that way I don't have to make long videos. We've been especially watching the peace and safety calls that have gone out. And that tells us that sudden destruction is coming. And we've seen this building over weeks and months even. Celestial signs going with the geopolitical signs. And this is what we are told we will see. What we will hear. We will hear multiple things coming together so that we will see the day approaching. If we are watching and paying attention to what scripture tells us to pay attention to, tells us to watch. And even in this passage, we are reminded by the Apostle Paul to watch and be sober. Which means pay attention to what scripture says. Don't get caught up by emotions and hype and the fad of the moment. No, just focus on what scripture says. And the more that we exercise being sober and focusing on what we are told we will see and hear, the more we will be on guard against sensationalism. Sensationalism in the news or even on YouTube. There's a lot of different channels who like to just throw stuff up against the wall. And they know there's a lot of Christians out there who are looking for some latest and greatest thing to tickle their ears and tickle their rapture fancy. So they'll just throw up anything against the wall. But no, we got to be sober. Let's look at what scripture tells us. Let's have a sober, grounded approach to what time it is. And this is why I keep reminding you what has Scripture told us to look for, to listen for, what we will see. The more we focus on that, the more we can see where we already are. We're not looking for new things to tell us where we are or how close we are. We already know. We just need to be reminded of that many times. Be reminded of the reality of where we are right now. And the more that we review what we have heard, what we have seen, what we see approaching, how we see that time is running out, the more that gives us the time based on the warnings we were told to see and watch. That will remind us to watch ourselves, take heed to ourselves where we are right now, that we are rising up and trimming our lamps and going out to meet the bridegroom, that we are watching what we are supposed to watch. Not always watching for new things and new things to tickle our ears, let us watch what we are told to watch, and then let us tend to what we are told to tend to. When we hear them say, Peace and safety, sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. We are already in the birth pangs right now. We're not waiting for more peace and safety calls. It's obvious we are already in the birth pangs. Sudden destruction is looming over the world right now, and even the world has the expectation that things can hit the fan any day now. And they have been accelerating every single day now too because we are already, already in the birth pangs. We've covered how the children of darkness, they have one mind. And again, this goes back to scripture foretells us so that we can have a biblical approach to be sober and to be grounded in understanding and seeing what is unfolding in this world. A true Christian who has been studying prophecy and looking at what scripture and Christ tells us is not surprised at all or shouldn't be surprised what's unfolding in the world right now. It should be expected. Why? Because we've already been shown the celestial signs that this day is coming, the great and terrible day. We've already been told how the mystery of iniquity is going to be working prior to that day. We've already been told what they will say as that day approaches. So it shouldn't surprise us. We just have to study it. We just have to remind ourselves what has Scripture said. And the more that we review what Scripture says and refresh our memory of what is going on, the more the Spirit can bring to our remembrance what Scripture does say. And that can further sober us as we watch and remind us of where we are and what our obligations are here at this time to take heed to ourselves. Watch ourselves so that we are ready as we go out to meet the bridegroom. Again, we are told the children of darkness are of one mind. They're already on the same page. All these different leaders of these different countries even, across different many miles and across the ocean, they were on the same page on the scenario. That is why ever since 2020, they've been working very suspiciously all together on certain things. Because the reason is they're all heading in the same direction. On the same direction. They're not going out to meet the bridegroom. They are deliberately going the other way. 
And the Bible tells us ahead of time, right before that great and terrible day comes, the children of iniquity will be deliberately walking the other way. They're not looking for Jesus Christ. They are actively looking for the Antichrist, the son of perdition, because that is the camp they belong to. And they are all going to be going that way, having one mind, because they are expecting him. And part of being sober at this time is not to view the events as singular or by themselves or just think that they have come up out of nowhere. Now, a lot of Christians I see act as though Putin is just making up all these actions on his own. And just out of the blue, he decided to attack Ukraine. And all out of the blue, NATO and the U.S. are suddenly outraged. And no, none of this is coming out of the blue at all. It's all on their script. They just check their pages. Yep, here we are. Time for this. They know exactly where they are. All this script has been in play for generations. You look again at the mural that's in the UN Security Council. That's been there for a long time. Getting so much in place. There are things that we are seeing today that were set in motion decades ago. What we're seeing today is not Putin's idea or just some lark that he's off on. No, they're off on the page that they're supposed to be on because they're all on the same page. Do not get caught up on looking at just the leaders, Zelensky and Putin and Biden and all them. No, just look beyond them. Look at their puppet strings. Who's orchestrating them? They're all on the same page. They all have the same puppet masters. Principalities and powers in high places, the demonic powers that rule this world. They are who's really pulling the strings. But they have their willing disciples, their willing children of darkness who are going forward obediently, obeying and following their script. That is in play for a long time. None of this is new. None of this is out of the blue. And as Christians, we've been forewarned about this in the very book of Revelation that is telling us what is about to come in that great and terrible day. And that's to give us a sober and grounded perspective on what we see right now. It already tells us the conclusion. So when we see the birth pangs, we automatically know it's not going to get better. We certainly see the commitment that all these nations are all in at this point. Russia is obviously all in. They're not going to just quit and give away. They are to the point where they're doing things to their country because they're committed to a total end goal. So has NATO, so has the European Union, so has America and Canada. They're all committed beyond totally, they're acting irrationally and hysterically from a secular, sober point of view. Just, why is everyone going bonkers all of a sudden? It's because they know what hour it is. And that is why they're committed well beyond rational means of what it would do normally to their country. That doesn't matter at this point anymore. All of them are committing to what would normally be long-lasting, irreversible damage to all of their nations because they know that is the end. That is the direction that they're going. They're all of one mind. And this is where their fraternal organizations, their occult organizations, all the different cliques that they've been in have been working toward for generations. And we're at this time where they have put it all into full motion. They have gone all in on it. We are at a time where we are expecting the great and terrible day of the Lord to come. We already are in the birth pangs presently. We already know it's coming. And that is because we have already seen the sun turned into darkness and the moon into blood. We've seen wonders in the heavens with the Star of Bethlehem signs and the Revelation 12 sign. And then that brought us to a very distinct celestial sign of the sun being turned into darkness and the moon into blood. Right before the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. We're foretold in Scripture that this distinct celestial marker will happen before. You will see it before. It won't be like 24 hours before or shortly before. It will be sometime before it where you will know once you see that sign, that day is coming. It's approaching. And the Apostle Paul tells us in the New Testament that we will see the day approaching. And it will be based on that he's about to stand up and start making his enemies his footstool. The heavens will declare. It will show wonders. It will show knowledge. It will have words and speech as we get close to that day that that day is about to start. Are we listening? Have we heard? Do we already know where we already are and what is coming next? The children of darkness know where we are. Do we? Have we heard what time it is on the celestial clock? I've had several people ask me about the upcoming blood moon that's going to be on May 16th of 2022. And they've asked, is this going to be the blood moon that Joel 2.30 talks about? No, it's not. We've already seen the sun turned into darkness and the moon into blood a few months ago. Right when all these things that we're seeing now started ramping up. 
But if you look at what's going to happen on May 16th, there will be a blood moon. And it's going to be a pretty solid blood moon. But two weeks before that, on April 30th, there will also be a partial solar eclipse. And this is important because Joel 2.30.31 tells us that the sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. So one way to know if the upcoming blood moon is the sign is to see, is it paired with a total solar eclipse where the sun is blackened out? And we can look at the upcoming blood moon. Okay, yeah, that's going to be a blood moon. But then we look at the eclipse that's paired with it. And solar eclipses and lunar eclipses, you'll always find two of them paired together two weeks apart. A pairing. And so this has been one thing that's been guiding our study is what two eclipses are paired together. And that is one way we also know this upcoming blood moon is not the sign. Because it's paired with, two weeks prior, a partial solar eclipse. And the sun will not be turned into blackness. It will still look almost completely normal for those that see it. I remember when the total solar eclipse that happened in America back in 2017 happened. We were in an area that didn't get the totality, but it still happened technically pretty partially in our area. But going outside, you could tell something was going on, but the average day was still lit like normal. The sun was not blackened. And even in an area of direct lineup with the partial solar eclipse, it really won't get any significantly darker. It's not going to blacken out the sun. So again, when we look at May 16th, that is going to be a blood moon, a very solid blood moon. But it's not paired with a total solar eclipse. So that automatically tells us it does not match the qualifications of Joel 2, 30, 31. It has one part, and those happen pretty oftenly. A blood moon eclipse happens fairly often. That's not unusual by itself. But if it's paired up with a total solar eclipse, then that really starts to capture attention. Because that isn't as normal. And so we've already seen the sun turned into darkness and the moon into blood. And we saw that back in November 19th, 2021, and also December 4th, 2021. So just a few months ago, and we especially covered this in our videos, His Ambassador Lights, That Mega O Day, and Double Eclipse Recap. Now the recap covers the core concepts. Some of the more scientific stuff and examination of all the eclipse happens in the other videos. So you can find links for these in the description box. I highly recommend if you're really interested in these blood moons and this Joel 230 sign, definitely review these videos. And that will really drive it home that yes, we have seen this sign that tells us the great and the terrible day of the Lord is coming. And this was just a few months ago, which is why we're not surprised with where we are now, hearing the calls of peace and safety, that sun destruction is coming because the heavens have already shown wonders and declared that that day is coming. We can see that day approaching. Again, in those videos, I did a very thorough examination of all the total solar eclipses from 1948 to 2030. And I looked at which ones were paired with a blood moon. Within two weeks of the total solar eclipse, which ones had a blood moon and lined up with other scripture passages that gave us an idea of what we would see too. So definitely check those out. Again, when you look on the timeline, links in the description box, we have a short view timeline, but also a wide view timeline. And that's because I want you to see back, way back, November and December, that is when that sign happened, Joel 2, 30, 31. We saw the blood moon that happened right near Pleiades, reminding us of the seven churches of Revelation, the seven stars. Right at this time, where our attention's also been drawn to the last page of Revelation, our attention has been already brought to the first pages of Revelation 2. And that was immediately followed, paired with, two weeks later, a total solar eclipse in Antarctica. An international territory telling the world that this is an international sign. So definitely review those videos. There's a lot more thoughts, too, of why it emphasized that this is the Joel 2.30 sign. And it is this context that reminds us and sobers us where we are now. Because since that event, we've seen the world ramp up. A tension building. There's been movies coming out. DiCaprio's Don't Look Up. That was only a few days later after the total solar eclipse. They put out this movie, Don't Look Up. About signs in the heavens from a secular perspective. But they're mocking Christians because they know what time it is. They also know the world has been told that great and terrible day is coming. They know what time it is. And that is why on January 20th, they updated the Doomsday Clock, announced it's at 100 seconds to midnight still, 
They left it where it was at 100 seconds to midnight, which it was moved to back in 2020. Remember when the Corona came out? That's when they updated it. But this has been the closest that is, has been to midnight since 1947. Right prior to Israel being replanted. They know the prophetic time. They know those events that led and orchestrated and rearranged the world chessboard, so to speak, that brought about the replanting of Israel too. They knew back then things were being set in place. The mystery of iniquity was getting all their players on the same page too. Again, what we're seeing today was started generations ago. But it was especially accelerated with the replanting of Israel in 1948. And just recently they... Reminded the world that we are 100 seconds to midnight on the doomsday clock. And this is the closest that it's been since 1947. Time where they are mockingly telling the world, don't look up, don't look up. You don't need to know what celestial time it is. You don't need to know the wonders that are in the heavens that are telling you the great and terrible day of the Lord is coming. Of course, we have seen we are now in the birth pangs of that day we are told was coming. We've heard the peace and safety calls really emphasized, especially on February 23rd and 24th, the highest leaders in our world. And then over the days beyond that, saying that same theme and even drawing attention to it with the missile strike on the International Peacekeeping and Safety Center there in Ukraine, pointing right at that theme. They know what time it is. All this is orchestrated. It's all orchestrated. And by reviewing what scripture tells us, we will see what will be declared, what will be shown, what will be heard. The more we can be reminded of where we are right now. We're not looking for more signs. We're not looking for new sensational things. We know where we are. We know we are running out of time. We do not know the day or the hour, the precise granular information, neither do they. But we both know we are running out of those days and those hours. We know exactly where we are. The birth pangs are still increasing every single day. Again, definitely review the timeline all the way back. Be reminded we are looking where we are, understanding where we are, understanding where we are. If we zoom in where we've been looking recently with these birth pangs that have been accelerated, we looked at last time on March 16th with Roman Abramovich's super yachts, the Eclipse and Solaris, how they are on the run from authorities who are trying to seize them. Very inner, the enemy knows what time it is. They know exactly what time it is. So on March 17th, Russia's Medvedev said regarding the sanctions, it will not work. Russia has the might to put all of our brash enemies in their place. And they made comments like this even when they were announcing the operation there in Ukraine, making it very clear, do not mess with us, do not get involved, or you will see consequences that you have never seen before. And this is part of understanding what's going on right now. You get a completely different view in the Western media, such as CNN and Fox and NBC and all that. They are propagating the idea that Russia is stalling or that they're being held back and that the Ukrainians are putting up a good fight and all that. They paint a picture that Russia is not making very great progress. And they're trying to make people think that Russia might quit or give up or even be forced out. And they have to put up that narrative so they have an excuse for their sanctions. They keep saying, oh, we got to do all these sanctions that will cost us and hurt us. But if we do it, maybe that can convince Putin to pull out of Ukraine. Whereas something that you need to keep in mind is Russia has several aces up their sleeve. They have military might up their sleeve that they're already hiding. And they were well prepared before they even went in. Don't mess with us. We can clean your clock, too, while we take care of Ukraine. And right now, even during all this, Mendev is still reminding the world, we still have the ability to put you all in your place, too. Don't mess with us. Stay out of this. And he was saying this in context of the sanctions, and he was reminding the world, your sanctions are not going to sway us any differently. We don't care. We, are all, we were already committed to this mission before you did all your sanctions. We already anticipated you were going to do all these sanctions. We already took into account how you might try to get involved in the situation there in Ukraine too. We already have countermeasures for that on the shelf. And we can clean your clock too if you get involved. This is something that we need to keep in mind with the narrative that's being pushed in mainstream media right now. Because they're trying to paint a picture of Ukraine that Ukraine is winning or that somehow Ukraine is holding their own against the big bad Russians and they just need a little extra help and they just need us to come alongside them and maybe with a no-fly zone, maybe they can finally push them out. That is the narrative in Western mainstream media. 
but they have to keep that up for them to have a pretense to get involved and to do things, to push and poke back at the bear. And as long as they can convince you that, oh, the Ukrainians are holding their own, they just need a little bit more help, they can convince you to go beyond rational means. Oh, we got to put in all these sanctions that, oh yeah, they're going to hurt us really bad too. But they're going to hurt the Russians worse than us. Don't worry, the Ukrainians just need a little push in the right direction and they'll be able to handle it. That's the narrative lie that's being put out right now. But the Russians are at the same time saying, no, we already took all this into account before we even started. And if you push us, we are still going to clean your clock and we still have the ability, we still have the aces up our sleeve to clean your clock. Don't mess with us. And this is important to understanding where we are, understanding they are of one mind. They're all on the same page. They both are pushing toward the end sudden destruction that is coming. It's not going to get better. They already know that. They just have to have a plausible excuse. How do we get there? How do we get to the sudden destruction that is going to explain away the rapture? And so they're going to have to find a storyline, a narrative that makes sense. It sounds plausible to the average person that, well, you saw how things escalate and it's just inevitable that, man, they just started shooting all these missiles at each other. So that is the end conclusion that they want to have in everybody's minds, or particularly the more Western mainstream mind and those who are listening to it. But at the same time, it's also being put out that Russia is warning the world, basically, we can still clean your clock if you try to do something. And they're sending a warning message, stay out, stay out. The Russian Ministry of Defense names the curator of the Pentagon-funded biolabs in Ukraine and releases the original documents. And again, like I've mentioned before, you're going to see, they seem to be building this narrative and going somewhere with it. Perhaps, plausibly, part of their excuse of if they do something regarding the U.S. and NATO or the EU or something like that, that it's going to sound plausible why they are acting a certain way. You're seeing a narrative that it explains both sides. Explains why both sides might want to push things a little bit farther than rational behavior would normally think. So we're seeing narratives from both sides that this is far more complicated than just Ukraine. There's biolabs involved. There's U.S. funding of these biolabs involved. There's U.S. funding of different radical groups in Ukraine too. This is, again, far beyond Ukraine. Again, don't think this is just some weird dream that Putin has about restoring the Soviet Union territory or something like that. It goes way beyond that. And even the mainstream media is reminding the world of these different subjects that are being brought up that it's far beyond Ukraine. It's a West versus East. And the West is really the aggressor. On the 17th, Pope Francis, in one of his addresses, he speaks on nuclear war and the day after. Again, using very high-level pulpits and platforms in our world to remind the world that, oh, we're on the brink of nuclear war. It could happen at any day, and that would be catastrophic if that happened. Well, yeah, I wonder who keeps bringing the subject up. Oh, yeah, the same people who are promoting it and orchestrating it. So again, they're keeping all these subjects on the world mind to keep them in that fear and the narrative of where things are going, of the quote-unquote inevitable you are not going to see any of these subjects go away. You're not going to see this conflict to die down. You're going to see the world increasingly reminded of it and reasons for it to happen too. The world is going to be increasingly given reasons reminding them of why things are going a certain way and what the conclusion is going to be. March 18th, Russia calls emergency UN Security Council meeting on U.S. biolabs. Beijing's ambassador to the UN said the evidence provided by Russia deserves a response without double standards. Again, these are, these are world leaders meeting here, the ambassadors at the UN Security Council, on this very subject about biolabs, which is basically bringing to the table that the US is directly targeting Russia. This whole ordeal is far beyond Ukraine. Just get that out of your, get that out of your mind right now. That's just a proxy. Russia and China both know this is about America versus Russia and China. That's why China has Russia's back on this. That's why China is willing to stand up at the UN Security Council and say, basically to America, you got double standards here. You got some major double standards. And you all should be listening to Russia's evidence that they're putting out about biolabs that you funded and you signed off on right there on the very border of Russia. 
What you're seeing is far greater than Ukraine. You're starting to see Russia and China butt heads with America. Ukraine just happens to be the proxy excuse where some of these blows are being exchanged. The sanctions are a blow by America and the West, NATO and EU too, against Russia. They're making those blows. It hasn't got hot yet, but you can definitely see this issue is not going away. And Russia and China are both getting really ticked off that America's not even in the EU and NATO. They aren't even addressing these subjects. And they're being some pompous hypocrites too at the same time with their double standards. So again, you're seeing a tension build. You're also seeing an exhaustion of diplomatic recourse. Again, like Russia was saying, hey, we've gone through all the diplomatic channels. We've gone through the normal, rational approach of asking you to address these situations, to address our grievances. You refuse to do that. Well, if you keep refusing to do that, then we're just eventually going to have to take matters into our own hands, which is what they've started to do with Ukraine. So the belligerence increases, the tensions increase. In a video call with U.S. President Joe Biden, China's president said that peace and security are the cherished treasures of the international community. Again, these are the very warnings we are told when they say the sun destruction is coming. So when we see the context that this keeps coming up in, why do they keep talking about peace and security? Because the U.S. president is calling China's president that they put pressure on Russia's president. Because Russia's president has a beef with the U.S. president. These are major powers that have a beef with each other and as they keep pushing these buttons, the subject and the public reminders go out that this is about peace and security. Not, not Ukraine. This is about peace and security between the US, Russia, China, and most of the world players right now too. And that's why we keep hearing these calls of peace and safety. It's because it definitely deals with the world's peace and safety right now. And they're making sure that it does, too. March 19th, Russia's Foreign Minister Lavrov, we will not be offering any initiatives on de-escalation with the West. Let's see how they'll be maneuvering out of the corner they got themselves into. Russia is laughing at the sanctions that Europe and the U.S. have put on Russia because they know it hurts Europe and America and Canada. They know it hurts them more than it hurts Russia. Russia's already planned for this. They've already baked it into the cake. They were expecting it. And they're laughing at the corner that America and Europe have put themselves into, wedged themselves into, causing harm to themselves. And Russia's saying, we're not going to de-escalate. No way. We're, we're just going to sit back and see how you deal with the corner that you put yourself into. You are hurting yourself on purpose. And we're just going to sit back and laugh. You will have no influence on their operation at all or their nation. And of course, anyone seeing the issue escalate over the past eight years too would have been able to tell NATO and Europe and America that you're not going to be able to change their opinion anyway. So again, that shows us that what Europe and America and NATO and all are doing, it defies rational sense. They're doing it deliberately, hurting themselves, hurting their own economies, their own supply chains, their own industry. They're hurting it on purpose, acting irrationally, even... Though everybody is telling them it makes zero difference, it has no effect on what Russia is doing. It actually makes the whole situation worse. It makes it all worse for everybody because it actually increases the tensions. On the 19th, Russia's hypersonic Kinzhal dagger missiles destroyed a major Ukrainian military fuel base in Nikolaev region. And this caught a lot of people's attention. It was in the news that they suddenly, for the first time in combat, used their hypersonic missiles. And this is one of Russia's supposed recent developments, goes 20 times the speed of sound, and it especially can be launched from a plane, a heavy duty lifting plane, but it can still be launched from within Russian territory and hit in Ukraine at hypersonic speeds. And this is important for several reasons because it demonstrates to the West, NATO, Europe, and America that we can hit wherever we want. We can hit it very precisely. We can also hit it with weapons that are going so fast that you can't do anything about it. In NATO and Europe admitted we could see it, we could see where it was going. They could see it. But the problem is, and they wouldn't admit the last part, is they could see where it was going, but there's really nothing that they could do about it. And it was moving so fast they didn't have the time to even warn where it was hitting either. And so Russia's demonstrating 
not only their strength, but they're demonstrating NATO in Europe and America's weakness. They're moving different missile defenses, such as the Patriot systems in Slovakia and Poland, and setting them up pretty close to the border. But Russia is demonstrating with these hypersonic missiles that it doesn't matter what you do. We can make strategic strikes pretty close to the border, and that's what they demonstrated with the strike on the International Peace and Security Center. It was a message to NATO and America and EU of, hey, stay out. You're really pushing it here, trying to ramp up support and bringing in extra armaments and starting to be a little bit more public about bringing in heavy armaments too. Stay out or we can reach out and touch you. Now I've seen how the mainstream media is trying to put a spin on all this. They say, oh look, Russia is using their fancy missile all of a sudden. That must mean they're running out of missiles. That must mean they're losing the war. That they have to suddenly resort to this high tech stuff that they haven't used yet. They're spinning it and trying to make people think that Russia is losing, even though they're doing very pretty good on the ground. And the fact that they can do strategic missile strikes right very close to the border, sending a message to NATO. They're spinning it of, oh, look, they have to use their newest and baddest thing. That means they're losing and or that they're running out of cruise missiles. No, it has nothing to do with that at all. You know, I've never been in the armed forces. I've never been a military general. I've never even really been an armchair general, I guess, except for now. But almost anybody can tell you if you're going to start a fight in an area where potential adversaries that are superpowers can get involved, like NATO and the EU and maybe America, if you're doing the planning for Russia, you automatically know, go into a war. You don't show all your cards at the beginning. You never show all your cards at the beginning. You don't even send in your best at the very beginning either. And so that's why we've seen a lot of what Russia has sent into Ukraine has been the reserves, the National Guard, hasn't even been some of their latest and greatest equipment either. And so the mainstream media has looked at that and they've portrayed it and they say, oh, look, Russia is weak. All their equipment's old and falling apart and they can barely manage their offensive. And, oh, look, they're now bringing out reserves and new tech that they've been holding off on. That's probably because they're running out of cruise missiles. No. No, that's it's strategy. They can send in the old stuff. They can send in the okay stuff to deal with the situation in Ukraine. But again, why are they holding cards back close to their chest? Because the situation is greater than Ukraine. They are deliberately holding things back, knowing that things are going to get hot, or could get hot, from a tactical perspective. And you always keep those cards in reserve. Knowing that NATO might try something stupid, EU might try something stupid, America most certainly might try something stupid. So you're going to keep those cards close to your chest. And yeah, you'll have your older equipment go out and take care of business in Ukraine and might take a little bit longer. But they send out enough to do the job, but they keep the cards close to their chest of their real toys and their newest equipment. And only when necessary will they flash it every now and then with these strategic strikes and make it clear to NATO, we can clean your clock. We can clean your clock. Stay out of our business. So this is what a lot of Westerners need to keep in mind with the mainstream portrayal. They're trying to make it look like Russia is losing the war. No, they're going forward very cautiously while holding their cards close to their chest because they have more than one ace up their sleeve. And they are expecting... NATO and Europe and America to do something stupid. And they are already prepared for them to do that. So expect a narrative to go along that way of why they're making the world think that Russia is weak so that they can do something stupid. And then Russia will smack them back. Like they've been warning all this time. Because they have not been putting all their cards out on the table. And anybody in the armed forces can tell you that the armed forces that are fielded for any military in the world, they are not the top notch. And by the time something is rolled out to the field and put into field use, it's already about 50 years old. It's not new technology. They let the populace think, oh, this is our newest and greatest weapon, but it's already old by the time it hits the field. All nations, America, Russia, and Europe, they have high, much higher technology weapons that they've held very close to their chest. And what you're seeing in Ukraine is old stuff. Even the new stuff is old stuff. There are cards that are being deliberately hidden, but Russia keeps reminding the U.S. and NATO don't do anything stupid. Because we will respond, and we will respond with consequences you cannot even imagine. 
Those were the exact words that Putin used on February 23rd. Why? Because they have those cards already up their sleeve. They weren't going to show you what those cards were at the beginning, but they do have those cards. And so these strikes that we're seeing recently are illustrating something very important about the storyline of where things are going. Because you see the West portraying, oh, Russia is weak. That means maybe we can be a little bit more bold in some of the stuff that we're offering to Ukraine. And maybe we can push these red lines a little bit further. We can put up missile defenses and patriot systems right on the border. We can maybe even try to sneak some tanks in too. And maybe, maybe some planes. You see how because of the Western storyline, they are starting to push vocally some of these red lines that Russia has already said don't. Don't. But the West will try to convince the average person that, oh, Russia's weak, it really, it really won't matter, we can take care of them. Um, that's the storyline. That America, that the EU and America and NATO is about to do something stupid. And the result will be inevitable. And anybody should have seen it coming. That's the storyline. And also on the 19th, Russia destroyed a large ammunition depot in western Ukraine with another hypersonic Kinzhal missile. Again, they're demonstrating we can reach out and touch you. We can launch these things all the way from Russia. And we can hit exactly what we want. And there's nothing you can do to stop it either. And we got a whole lot more where these came from. I've seen Western media say, oh, they just got a few of those hypersonic missiles. And, you know, they're very expensive, so they're not going to waste them. They don't have that many of them. Again, no. By the time any nation fields something and actually starts using it on the field, they have a whole bunch of them. They have a whole bunch of them by the time they do that because it's old technology by that point. March 20th, 100 Ukrainian covert op troops and foreign mercenaries killed by missile strikes on Ukrainian base in Overwatch west of Kiev. Again, this is in the west of Kiev, which means it's closer to the Polish border. And again, they're sending a message because the west keeps making it out as though Russia's losing. So we'll try to keep pushing the red lines a little bit and we'll send some of these mercenaries in, even though we know it ticks Russia off. But every time they do that, Russia makes a precise missile strike right on those bases where those mercenaries are and kills them in large numbers. And they're driving home a message to NATO and also the mercenaries too. Stay out. Because unlike American wars, we have the air superiority here. We can reach out and touch you as soon as you cross that border. These missile strikes are messages that y'all need to stop doing something stupid. But the West keeps doing something stupid, and that's where it's going, too. Russian forces close to defeating Ukrainian Nationalist Battalion Donbass, Defense Minister says. And this is very important over in the east of Ukraine. Russia is making some significant, very significant advances, taking a lot of territory, but also surrounding the Ukrainian forces, and there's thousands of them there, circling them and squeezing them off like a python in what are called cauldrons. The Russian war strategy is different than American, and that is why Americans can't understand or they think Russians are losing. Russians are approaching the battlefield different than Americans. They are trying to encircle large numbers of the enemy soldiers, and they have, and they're going to wear them down to where they surrender. And this is very important because they've already surrounded three different nodes of different groups there, the Ukrainians, and they're very close here, they say, to defeating the battalion Donbass. But different commenters have said it's just a number of days before they get the rest, those other nodes that are over there in the East Ukraine, to surrender. And once they surrender, that's going to be a massive loss to the Ukrainian army. That's thousands upon thousands of soldiers that are most likely going to surrender. And once that happens, which, again, several people have said it might even happen by the end of this week, definitely by the end of the month. It's inevitable at this point because they're already basically surrounded. It's inevitable. When that happens, it's going to become profoundly obvious to the world that Russia is the one that has the upper hand here. Because they have forced a large portion of the Ukrainian army to surrender. So sometime between the end of this week and approaching the end of this week, maybe even in this week, you're going to start to see a large number of Ukrainian soldiers being forced to surrender. You're also going to see the picture become very clear that Russia is not losing at all. It's Ukraine that is losing by handfuls. Which also changes the narrative because a lot of the NATO, Europe, and American narrative has been 
premised by, oh, look, Russia's losing. So let's push these red lines a little bit. Let's put all these sanctions on ourselves that hurt us. Let's hurt ourselves a lot because Ukraine just needs a little push and they'll be able to run the bad guys out. But once these large portions of the Ukrainian army start surrendering, which is inevitable at this time because Ukraine can't send them any reinforcements or supplies. They've already told them, you're on your own. It's inevitable at this point. Once that starts happening, the excuse for all those sanctions disappears. And so the West is going to start asking themselves, the average person, of, okay, Russia's already winning. Ukraine needs to surrender. It's pointless at this time. These sanctions are doing absolutely nothing. We're hurting ourselves. It's obvious that it's gone beyond the point of sanctions. So why are we doing this to ourselves? And at that point will also be gone the excuse for NATO and the EU to intervene, and America too, to intervene under the excuse that it might turn the tide of war conventionally. Because once large portions of the Ukrainian soldiers start surrendering because they have run out of supplies and a large portion of the East has been taken and Russia has it firmly and makes it very clear that they're not going to give it up whatsoever, then you start getting to a point where NATO, Europe, and the Americans realize, and even the average person is going to realize, if the tide is going to be turned, you're going to have to use non-conventional weapons because it's gone too far for it to change just with sanctions. So I am fully expecting sometime this week the subject to come up that the sanctions have reached their limit. And it's going to be really clear that we're starting to enter non-conventional territory here. You're going to start seeing more talk of, we got to send a very strong message. Somebody has to send a very strong message because this is not going in a good direction. And who's going to be the one who needs to send a strong message? That's going to be NATO, the EU, and America. They're going to be the ones who are going to need to send a strong message. It won't be Russia. They have no reason to utilize nuclear weapons in this scenario because they are winning. And it's inevitable that the Ukrainian army is going to be surrendering in large numbers very soon. So you're going to expect a large message needed to be sent by the West. By the West. So this is very important to observe. What is the storyline being put out? Why do they want the average person to think that Russia is losing? So that when it becomes clear that Russia is winning, desperate times call for desperate measures, right? And that's going to be the storyline. On March 20th, Zelensky bans main Ukrainian opposition party and almost a dozen opposition parties. They're cracking down on dissent in Ukraine. Banning the opposition parties, plural, from the Ukrainian parliament. Now, of course, what does that make Zelensky? It makes him a dictator. You get rid of the opposition parties, you're a dictator. To where what you dictate is law. That's what, he, that's what he's doing. It's literally the definition of a dictator. That's a big clue about the leadership there in Ukraine. Also on the 20th, China warns of, quote, unimaginable consequences if Russian nuclear power is forced into a corner. Wow, imagine that subject coming up. I wonder who would be forcing them into a corner, trying to send a strong message. Oh yeah, that would be the West. And both Russia and China know it. The opening blows, you're going to see, watch, just watch it. It's going to be coming from the West. It's going to be coming from the West. It's going to escalate immensely across the major nuclear superpowers. On the 20th, Zelensky says World War III is assured if negotiations with Russia break down. And he's been getting very dramatic with some of his messages lately and not going very well either. But even he's publicly saying if this doesn't get resolved, World War III is inevitable. And why is that? Because ultimately this is a conflict between the East and the West. And eventually somebody is going to have to send a strong message. The West has been sending very strong messages with their sanctions. But you're going to see the storyline get to the point where, Oh, well, we, were, we ran out of options. We have to do something non-conventional now. Because we have to stop Putin. And so the public keeps being reminded... World War III is inevitable if this situation doesn't get better. That's the storyline that's going out. That's also the narrative and the same page that all the world leaders are on, too. They just have to make the results look plausible. Friend, I hope you can see where things are going and why the storyline is being said a certain way. 
and why certain actions are being done to reinforce that storyline. It's going to make it all look inevitable because they know that script-wise it is inevitable. They just have to make the average person in the world believe it. And I also hope you notice how they're pushing that this can happen at any day. And also see why they're emphasizing with the storyline that things are going in a certain way that a strong message is going to have to be sent pretty soon to somebody. And somebody's going to have to do that even if it hurts ourselves. You're going to see the narrative go, go that way real quick here, Lee. Probably this week. Probably this week. I hope you can see this, friend. One thing that's been really interesting to observe in the news during this time of peace and safety and with what the heavens are declaring is to see concepts that even remind us of what the book of Revelation talks about with the mark of the beast. Within just the past few hours, the news has come out of the Russians, how they've been surrounding Muripol, and they're allowing evacuees, they're allowing people to evacuate the city. But one thing that they're doing is they're checking all of the men who come out of the city. All of the evacuees, all the ones who are supposedly civilians, they're checking all of the men, having them take off their shirt. Because they're really checking for who are the neo-Nazis from the Azov Battalion and the right sector. Who are the neo-Nazis? They have tattoos that identify them. Marks that identify them. And this just blew me away how such a blatant example of how commonly society resorts to this and how tattoos are one of the most easiest ways to identify who people are aligned with who they are aligned with why because people will tattoo themselves lining themselves up with whom they already believe in and causes they are already behind it shows allegiances allegiances and identifying tattoos is one of the most super simple ways to mark people. When I saw this in the news, I just had to shake my head, just reminding us of the reality of what Revelation says. That the beast will be putting his mark to identify those who have made allegiance to him during the tribulation time. And here we are, where we've even been forewarned by the heavens that great and terrible day is coming. Where the mark of the beast will be implemented. And here we have the historical example presently in our time showing how super simple it is to differentiate where people's allegiances are based on a simply a mark. Simply a mark. And these aren't simple marks that they're doing. Finding a neo-Nazi mark on these individuals is most likely a death sentence for them. Because the Russians have made it very clear from the beginning of their operation, they are coming to denazify Ukraine. And that is the whole reason they've been targeting the Azov Battalion and the right sector. Because there are Nazis. There are neo-Nazis there. And that is why they're checking for these neo-Nazi tattoos on all of the men coming out of these areas that they've surrounded. They want to make sure none of the enemy soldiers try to escape disguised as a civilian. So they're checking for tattoos. They're also checking for marks typically done on a soldier's body, bruises caused by machine guns and some of the equipment straps. So, so they're checking for multiple things, but especially for neo-Nazi tattoos. You can't hide it. It shows who your allegiance is toward. And it is very well known that there in Ukraine, the neo-Nazi groups are very proud of their Nazi tattoos. They'll have some type of Adolf Hitler or Eagle and Swastika or other references to Hitler, such as 88. 88 is code for HH, Hail Hitler. 88 is the gematria of HH. So it's a code word way to hide Hail Hitler. It's a, but it's a neo-Nazi tattoo. And so this is some of the things they're checking because they know these groups, these individuals, show their allegiance with these marks on their body. And the men typically put them on their chest and their arms. So that's why they're having all the men take off their shirts. They're checking everybody that comes out of this area. Everybody. And again, it reminds us of how the Bible tells us there will be a mark during the tribulation time, and it will apparently be a tattoo. And I highly suggest you check out our short playlist, Sola Scriptura, which covers the Mark of the Beast studies. There's been a lot of crazy nonsense on YouTube the past two years trying to make people think that the coronavax is the Mark of the Beast, but it absolutely has nothing to do with it at all. In these videos, there's only four videos. Watch them. We go through what does scripture say. It's called sola scripture because that's, that is what all of our basis is on. By scripture alone. 
What does the Bible say the mark of the beast is? How is it used? How is it reinforced? It's a super simple system. We also compare why the vaccine can't be the mark of the beast either. It will be a tattoo. So I highly recommend you watch this playlist. You can find the link in the description and in the list of our playlist too. Again, it just blows my mind that here at this very late hour, at this threshold where we know sudden destruction is coming and it's going to usher in the Antichrist, while even the children of darkness are getting ready to hand power over to the very one who's going to be making an image and causing people to bow down and worship it and taking his mark of allegiance. We are right on that threshold. The news is filled every single day with the children of darkness getting ready to hand power over to him. And what do we see right here at this very late hour? A vivid illustration how super simply and easy it is to identify someone on the sober subject of life and death just by their mark of allegiance. Just by their mark of allegiance. And the Bible is very clear. It's going to be on a very visible place. You won't have to take off your shirt. You won't be able to hide it either. It'll be on your forehead or on your hand if you take the mark of the beast. If you worship, and that's going to be a mark that you have worshipped the beast. The act of worship will come before you take the mark. The mark just demonstrates what has already been done. The decision that has already been made. We have a very sober reminder in the news today of how close we are to the great and terrible day approaching. We see the words of scripture becoming real right before our eyes. Very real. And this is why we need to review the timeline. Review what the heavens have declared that have been shown in the heavens, the signs that are warning us ahead of time, that great and terrible day of the Lord is coming. It's coming. You don't need more signs. You don't need more sensational things to tell you. It's a simple sign that tells you it's coming. You will now hear them say the calls of peace and safety. And that tells you sudden destruction is coming. A sudden destruction. And you're going to see them ramp up getting ready for it before the beast Antichrist is even here. We have already been shown all the reminders of where we are. And the more that we review what we have seen, what we have heard, the more we can focus on what we need to be doing now, watching ourselves and being sober, knowing the conclusion, knowing how things are going, knowing where things are going. And all this reminds us we are at the days of Noah and Lot right now. We are 100 seconds to midnight. He is nigh even at the door. Do we realize the reality of Christ's promises and what is about to come on this world? Is that affecting how we live? Are we taking heed to ourselves Casting off the cares of this life, casting off the works of darkness, casting off any weights and anything else that pulls our attention away from knowing what time it is, what time it is already, where we are already. We're not waiting for more signs. We are already here in the birth pangs presently. Review the timeline. Review the links that are in the description box. Remind yourself what we have heard. Remind yourself about what we have been shown. Check out the PDF resources that are in the description box. Check out the videos that are listed in the description box. The playlists that are in the description box. Our Father has given us so many resources because He wants us to know. He wants us to see. He wants us to hear. He wants us to rise up and live as though we know what time it is. He wants us to watch. Not just with our eyes, but with our heart, with our hands, with our feet, with our life. Watching with our life. And especially as we see so many reminders that he is nigh even at the door, he expects us to live as though we know he is nigh even at the door. Time is very short. You can find these resources and much more at rapturelibrary.com. Rapturelibrary.com. We have no excuse. We just need to review what we've already heard, what we've already seen, what we've already been told, what has already been declared. The words and speech of what the heavens declare, but also what scripture declares. We have no excuse. Therefore, we can't make excuses. Let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another, and so much the more, as ye see the day approaching. That great and terrible day approaching. Do you see it? Did you hear the warnings? Did you hear what the heavens declare? Did you hear what scripture warns you will hear? Do you see the day approaching? And friend, if your life is not showing it, then you haven't heard it. You might have heard it with your ears. You might have heard it with your eyes on YouTube. But if your life is not showing it, then your heart hasn't seen it. Your heart hasn't heard it. And this is why the Apostle Paul emphasizes, when you see the day approaching, 
You need to make sure your hands see the day approaching. You need to make sure your heart sees it. You need to make sure your life sees it. You need to make sure that your father sees it. Sees that you see how late the hour is. And so much the more as you see the day approaching. Our Father wants to see us rising up, not making excuses, rising up, being provoked unto demonstrations of love through our good works, demonstrating that we see the day approaching. Yes, we see the day approaching. That will be reflected in our life. That will be reflected in how we shine. It will be reflected in that we make no excuses because our heart fully sees the day approaching and we will go forward as though we see the day approaching without excuses, without excuse, and therefore, no regrets, no regrets. Friend, I want you to see the day approaching. I want your life to see the day approaching. We've heard so many trumpet calls at midnight that have told us this day was coming. The great and terrible day of the Lord is coming. The sun destruction is coming. It's told us even how it would be coming. We've been told so much on the celestial learning journey and the scriptural learning journey by being reminded through the Holy Spirit, having an ear to hear what Scripture has said. That's how we can clearly see what's going on in the world right now and also clearly see what is coming, but also clearly see how we should be living, how we should be taking heed to ourselves, like the wise servants, like the wise virgins. When we see ourselves, the more we can trim our lamps so we shine brighter, so we can rise up, and so we can go out to meet the bridegroom. We know where the world's going. We know where the children of darkness are going. They're going in the wrong direction. What about us? What about us? Which way are we going? Are we going nowhere? Are we sitting on our duff doing nothing for the Lord? Not rising up, not trimming our lamp, doing nothing? Or are we rising up with everything that we see? Does our life see what time it is? What late hour it is? Do we see what time it is? Are we rising up and provoking each other unto love and unto good works? And so much the more. Are we shining bright? Are we raising our light high so all the world can see, making it clear where we are going? We are drawing nigh to the bridegroom. We are going out to meet him. We are going to sup with him. It does not matter which way the world is going. It does not matter which way the foolish virgins are going. It doesn't matter which way the foolish servants are going. I am going out to meet the bridegroom. I am going to rise up. I am going to purpose in my heart that I will go out to meet him. Go ye out to meet him. So friend, I want you to join me. Let's rise up together. Let's trim our lamps, let's put on the armor of light, put on our Lord Jesus Christ, and let's go out to meet Him, fellowshipping with Him, drawing nigh to Him with a true and genuine heart, a purified heart. Let's go out to meet the Bridegroom, hearing Him, heeding Him, loving Him, and serving Him, first and highest above all else, being found with our loins girded and with our lamps burning till He comes. Maranatha!